Hey everybody, hey guys over in the food, um, we, we're going to kick off here pretty soon, you guys can uh, grab a seat. Uh, hello. Alright, cool. Um, how's everybody here tonight? Good? Alright, a couple of important things. Uh, okay, the restrooms are through the back, uh, out by the, where the registration tables, and then there's uh, women and men. Okay, so. uh, and the other thing is, uh, we still have probably a lot of beer and some food left, so you can hang out. <laughs> and I, I think the cake reader is still full of fun, but we'll see. Um, so tonight, legal panel. Um, top mistakes startups make. Uh, hashtag pound level Monday, pound day. But, uh, um, so a, a couple of stuff about myself. I'm Mario Tapia, president of Mobile Monday. So I've been doing community uh, for about 15 years now, so since 1999, organizing uh, mobile developers and entrepreneurs um, as an expensive hobby. Uh, so, uh, uh, so uh, tonight's agenda is like I'll do the welcome. Uh, we have our handsome, handsome Ross. Well, but Rock will be uh, giving some slides about uh, Eric Fox, um, and then we'll go to our panel discussion. And I want the panel to be engaging. Uh, we have a very animated uh, moderator here tonight, um, but I also want uh, to you to engage the audience for uh, it's, this is basically uh, yeah have some have some fun with uh, with the panel because you're probably billing about five thousand to six thousand dollars an hour for the guys who are up, from, up on stage. So and it's free. So use your time wisely. Uh, Mobile Monday grassroots organization. We're a nonprofit. Uh, in the league of NFL and some other organizations. <laughs> and uh, so Austin, I had to look up, what is a final <laughs> one C6? And I was like, oh, the NFL is just like one. But um, so we're in different cities. We have Austin, Chicago, Silicon Beach, which is LA. We're here in the Valley, Boston, Seattle, New York. We're also, you know, we're in Miami and we're in Philadelphia. Um, so um, kind of, we kind of are a big thing. Um, 140 cities worldwide. Um, I think right now footprints 200, maybe up to 500,000 developers and entrepreneurs in the total network. So basically from Tel Aviv to Tokyo, Jakarta to Jamaica, um, lots of, lots of uh, cities out there. Um, so this is kind of the breakup. Typically, I, I, you guys who signed up on Eventbrite, there's a questionnaire that you fill out. So about a third of us are, okay, who are the BD folks? BD developers? All right. Product marketing. Who are founders? Who are, who are the founders in here for startups? Cool. Who are, who are aspiring founders? We want to be. That's why you guys are here. Okay, cool. Um, and also we have DC designers and media for the audience. So um, quickly, this is kind of like uh, what our month looks like. We do the monthly meetup like this. We do uh, Mobile Monday Labs, which are basically the, the, better, the, the better and new, new hackathon. So basically, it's just more instruction and very hyper-focused on, on, on teaching and learning. And we also have our CXO dinners. Um, and this is basically a round table, VIP only. But if you guys are interested, um, we can talk to, engage with you on any of these to help you out, um, at least to read the developer, um, developer community. You can find us on www.mobilemonday.us. Um, we're also on Meetup. Our Twitter is MomoSD. We're on Facebook. And then we're also on YouTube. So this is... Um, this is recorded by our historian. Um, so, um, so here's the team. We have uh, President Ryan's out here, CFO, and and and, and sponsorship. Uh, Monica is kind of helps plan this whole thing. So all the goodies, the chocolates, the beer and stuff. So Monica's been awesome. Um, Chelsea is. Uh, you probably saw her at registration. Stephanie, you'll we'll see her running around and probably tweeting and retweeting your quotes tonight. And then John is our with a new title, because <laughs> video was, <laughs> it was like, he's on the AV team, um, but uh, yeah, we, he's our historian. Uh, special thanks to Aaron Fox tonight, Congratulations. for hosting us, so <laughs> give him a shout out, thanks for the beer, Aaron Fox and Rackspace. Um, and also we had uh, beer by Duvel, so the Belgian beers, and each one of them is new, so he, they brought the, you guys, you guys, who tried the tea? The tea oh, yeah. is, and that, oh, that, and that like latte tea is awesome. So that was really good. Um, all right, who knows about Momentum the Accelerator? Who's heard of it? 
All right. All right. So quickly, um, Momentum is something we started almost two years ago. Um, it's an accelerator to focus on mobile uh, mobile startups. And but it's not early stage. It's, don't, it's not about ideas and help you build the idea. It's like, hey, Mario, I've been working on this thing for two years. I have good, really good traction, but I need some help. I'm going to get ready for my Series A funding, and I'm going to need some help. Like, how do I get to the metrics and, and some of the uh, milestones that could help me get my Series A? Um, but also, um, we look for, for startups that we can actually present to Fortune 500. So, um, at a high level, there's Todd. Todd's around here somewhere. He's awesome. He's also part of the Band of Angels and also Mobile Angels Group. Investment, Ryan. Um, also part of the Mobile Monday team has been, um, you know, he's got an awesome background in, in venture. He's also our millennial, so he, he's getting the pulse of what all the new kids are like. Um, I myself has got uh, 15 plus years in the mobile industry, and then Mike Rowell is our entrepreneur in residence. Um, basically, um, he's our he's our lucky rabbit's foot. He's I think six for six, five, five. five. Everything he's done has exited, and it's not small. It's like Apple, Google. <laughs> Uh, and as a technical founder, and he's awesome, uh, at least on the technical back end. He knows mobile very well. Uh, momentum program, uh, basically we closed up applications a couple of weeks ago. Um, we will kick off in early July as a 12-week program. And we'll probably be running this in nine months from now, we'll probably have another, another program going on. But essentially, um, a lot, it's very intense, uh, a lot of hands-on, and a lot of focus on helping your business grow. And it's a tailored, it's a tailored program. So every every startup gets different different treatment and different uh, focus. We help you with funding. We focus on the deals before the funding, um, and also we give you some awesome programming and, and outreach to the to the community here. We give you awesome mentorship. Right now, I think we're over 100 mentors of the who's who of the valley. We give you awesome exposure, getting you up in, into the different events and conferences, and we have tons of perks in terms of free software, etc. Um, so this is our portfolio from last year. Um, Ten of these have already now done funding in excess of 20 million, and um, we're looking forward to actually some having uh, more success this year. And pretty much we're an anomaly in terms of statistically we've been outperforming many of the other accelerated programs out there. So we've done two classes, 14, uh, 14 companies. We've been able to raise, help them raise and post uh, post the post program. Um, and these are some of the investments that these guys are getting. So this is are not unknown uh, investors. These are strategic investors that help that are um, definitely helping them grow their business. Um, and then these are part of the deals. These are brands that, that we engage with to bring to the table. So we're very different from early stage. So you do Y Combinator 500 startups. We want to see you in about 18 months after you do that those programs, because then you're about ready to. Uh, it takes about 12 months to be honest with you. If you're doing 15 years of mobile product, but 12 months to really get all the feature sets that you really want to. Do. In, a, in an app or, or some type of application. Mentor network, um, heavy. We're, we're heavy on ad tech, um, but we also, you know, we're in all the OEMs, operators, brands, all the internet service providers, and, um, and then some. So, um, highly networked. And then here's some of our partners. So, we have Women in Wireless, App Nation, Girls in Tech, and also uh, Digital Garage. So, who knows about Digital Garage, guys? You know, out of Japan. Uh, agency plus also an investment fund. Um, they brought the internet to Japan. Um, they have a new office downtown, um, and uh, we'll be co-locating the um, the cohort in the, the, the next batch with them. Okay, and then this is kind of what we look for on the startups: awesome team, mobile focused, having a live product. I think a lot of the applicants kind of miss that. They said, "Oh, I have an idea. I have some thoughts." No, you have to have a live product. And we look for traction. You know, traction is, I have five thousand downloads. No, I want fifty thousand, half a million, five million downloads. Uh, that's where, that's what kind of where it really counts. And you can, and then we can, you know, do a couple of um, uh, numbers of mag uh, numbers of, of magnitude on that. And then we also help with angel and seed funding, and um, we look at uh, kind of basically if someone's invested in you crazy enough, then we want to look at you as well. Um, that's about it. So check us out at Momentum VC. We're closed for applications now. We start in about a month and uh, look forward to applications um, starting about six months from now. So, um, so tonight, why legal mistakes? Um, so this is part of the entrepreneur series. So we do a lot of topics focused on entrepreneurship. 
Um, and, and basically, a lot of a lot of people who are aspiring entrepreneurs, you kind of need to hear the story. This is one of my favorite topics that we do almost every year. Um, and we focus on like how to start your new company, to hear some awesome, really horrible stories that startups make, uh, and that's also like stump a lawyer night. So who brought a, who brought in a contractor agreement with them? <laughs> and I'm like, hey, can you help me here? All right, because we had that happen last time. I thought it was so funny. I was like, hey, here, I'll show you to you. <laughs> but. Uh, um, but uh, stump a lawyer night. So basically, I want interaction. So like, you can. Um, I, I don't consider it as as uh, official counseling, but maybe some opinions. Um, and <laughs> and uh, so yeah, I basically make it very interactive. This is a learning session for tonight. Um, and we have a quick announcement. Harry, Harry, where are you? Come on up. So Harry flew in all the way from Germany. Come on up. <laughs> uh, and he's. Uh, so next month there is a wearable tech conference. So Harry's been doing wearable stuff when it wasn't sexy. So come on, Harry, tell us a bit more. Great, thanks, Mario. Hi, good evening, everybody. So it's great to be here. Wearables, indeed, uh, is, is a topic which is hanging around already since six, seven, eight years uh, with clothes and uh, some of the early topics uh, with shoes and the likes. But now it's really hype. I suppose some of the Founders here are also involved in wearables. Anybody has some, some topics in wearables? Did you just know? Okay, that's not a lot. Maybe you have to, to uh, increase your, your program, acceleration program, including the wearables on that side. <laughs> Who has heard about wearable technologies? Okay, wearable technologies group is uh, the business platform basically where I've been joining. Uh, we're driving that since several years, as Mario was saying. We are based in Germany. I have an office recently also in San Francisco, we have three obviously as well. We are running a global innovation program since several years trying to identify the most innovative companies on the street in the various sectors, healthcare, fitness, sports and the likes. And um, having now in beginning of July, 8th of 9th of July, here in San Francisco our third event, our third conference, uh, the Wearable Technologies Conference for Mason. Fantastic place, we always enjoy to be there. Last year it was the America's Cup passing by, it was great uh, when we had our, our event there. So anybody who is interested in this topic, uh, I'd like to invite you to join, to come there. There's some information out there in the table, there's special discounts for startups anyhow. Uh, if you have questions, just ask Mario. We're looking forward to seeing maybe the next uh, Fitbits, Jawbones, uh, Recon Instruments and the likes uh, coming out of the valley, as well as we do that also seeing uh, coming out from Asia and from other parts of the world. It's definitely a mega trend, it's not just a hype, it's overhyped now, obviously. There's so much rumors and so much discussion around that, but there's such a fundamental substance in wearable technologies in combination with mobile phones, with smartphones, to drive, to change behavior actually, to live healthier, to be connected with the smart environment, and there's so many solutions that are possible. So anybody who has uh, some kind of solution already in a certain maturity level, prototypes uh, and some, uh, maybe already some, some first uh, uh, trials in the field that is welcome to participate. The program is called Innovation World Cup. We have currently the Soccer World Cup, I heard USA won today, is that right? Yeah. 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 Was it? Yes. Because I saw just Germany this morning. Yeah, we, we had a good match this morning. <laughs> So when is Germany and US? US, US team, what is it? No, we don't talk about it. Okay. Anyhow, we got, just for your knowledge, we got the rights to call our global innovation program Innovation World Cup for wearable technologies, for IoT. So anybody who has some good ideas is welcome to join there. Looking forward to seeing maybe some of you beginning of July in Fort Mason. Thanks very much, Mario. Thank you. Thanks, you Eric. Know, uh, you know, I'll do a follow-up and you guys will have the, the discount code. Um, for next month, let's see. And then next I have, um, Russ Budrock has a couple of words to say um, about entrepreneurship and legal mistakes. Thanks Mario, I guess calling it a keynote is probably an overstatement. This is, this is a, yet another advertisement here at Fox, but because um, if you haven't seen enough of our propaganda around already, but uh, I'm Ross Buntrock, I'm the head of the Communications Mobile Technology Group at Air and Fox. I'm based in Washington, D.C. Uh, we are really excited to be working with Mario and the Gold Monday uh, group here in San Francisco 
this is the first of several that we are going to be sponsoring and uh, participating in, so we're, we're really excited to be here. Uh, we opened our office here in San Francisco exactly one year ago, and I'm excited to I have two of my colleagues uh, on the panel here tonight, Pam and Imran, uh, a good, good friend and client of ours, Brian Mullen from Twilio, is going to be on the panel tonight. So we are excited to be here, and I'll uh, just give you a little uh, commercial Aaron Fox, founded in 1942. DC, New York, LA, San Francisco offices. We've got big clients, small clients, and everything in between. Uh, we've got a lot of smart people that work with us, and so we are not uh, truly. Better? Yeah. A different? Um, anyway, we've got every practice group under the sun, so any legal problem you might have, we can help you with. Uh, we have an emerging companies practice, so we work with startups. Uh, we get all sorts of advice on formation, structuring, funding, uh, intellectual property advice, a lot of the topics that we're going to be talking about on our panel here tonight. Uh, we you need to lobby the government, we can help you with that, so if you need to real estate uh, help to uh, get your new space opened up, we can help you with that. Uh, this is just a little bit of a description, and all this stuff is on the handout that is on your chair, but this is uh, a little bit about what my group does. Uh, we've been representing disruptive technology companies for a long time, I, myself personally for the last 20 years. Uh, and people from uh, Twilio to free conferencing to a lot of other companies that you've heard of. And then just to, um, and, and I want to plug our, my IP colleagues here, again, one of the top practice groups in the country in terms of intellectual property, and uh, can help you protect your intellectual property, uh, represents you if you get involved in litigation, and deal with any other issue that may arise in, in that realm. Uh, I'm going to run through my, my, I don't have top 10 of the mistakes, but the top four that I, that I have encountered personally uh, is basically people not knowing when to hire or engage with a lawyer. Um, some people, you're, you're sitting around, you're, you're talking to your founders, you've got ideas, you've got intellectual property that you have developed, that you're developing, you're talking about who owns what, what percentage, and uh, it's it's you never really know like when it's the right time. And so I, I'm hoping to address this issue in terms of when it's the right time to consult an attorney. This is the one that is uh, probably nearest and dearest to my heart, and that is uh, not really having a grasp <coughs> on the regulatory risks that might be facing your company. And this is an issue that is kind of near and dear to my heart because I've been in Washington for 20 years. And people here in Silicon Valley and San Francisco who are doing all these amazing things and developing new technologies, new apps, aren't thinking about the, the people in Washington and maybe the people in Sacramento who've got jurisdiction potentially over pieces of your business, technologies that you're using, particularly if you're using, uh, you're going to be kind of leveraging consumer data. And so the FTC has gotten very active, uh, the California AG's office has gotten very active in terms of consumer data issues, and so that's another uh, area that I want to focus on a little bit tonight. Uh, the third thing that I think is the biggest problem that I've seen uh, among my clients is failing to adopt and, in, most importantly, adhere to good privacy policies and good terms of use. A lot of people cut corners when they're getting started, and I've seen more companies that I could care to talk about basically cut and paste a privacy policy and a terms of use they have no idea what it says. And when you get in trouble, the way you get in trouble with privacy policies in terms of use is by not doing or what you say you're going to do. There, there's really no requirement that you actually have one, but if you have one, you've got to do what you say you're going to do. So who, who's done that already in this room? Cut and paste the... <laughs> <laughs> yes, I, I did it myself. So. Take it down. <laughs> uh, and this is the last one. This is, you know, number one, I, Entering into bad agreements. This comes in, in really two major areas. Uh, in dealing with your employees or your contractors, not properly classifying people, not getting uh, people with uh, the right non-competes, the right non-solicits, not having the, the proper protections for yourselves in terms of the development of intellectual property, and then vendor agreements. I mean, this seems very basic, but I've seen people sign deals for major pieces of software, major systems, without having any really idea about what's going to happen if the deal goes wrong. And so that's the way you need to approach every deal is assume that everything is going to, the shit's going to hit the fan and you're going to be in litigation, then what? So those are the big areas that... Um, so you mean I can't hire my best friend to do some coding and he's like, hey dude, I need some help with the database thing. And he just, and he writes like five lines of code 
and, and then I, I become a billionaire, you know, exit, and then I get sued. Exactly, because you know, he works for Google, his full-time job, and you know, Google's going to claim ownership of that, and so yeah, you get into all sorts of those issues. So anyway, we'll, we'll get into all the fun stuff uh, that goes along with, with some of these things uh, but, um, as we uh, get to the rest of the time. Okay. I got, thank you very much, and I'll look forward to engaging with you as we uh, go on tonight. Cool. Thanks, Ross. Hi, guys. Uh, uh, I'd I'll, um, I'll like to introduce our moderator tonight. That's Greg. Ovale, but known as Ovi, and he is in a stealth company, which is really awesome, though. So, uh, but I'll introduce Greg, and Greg, I guess you can uh, bring the panel up and have us have a seat. Thanks, Thanks Mario. Uh, well, actually, why don't you guys all come up? Hi, everybody. How are we tonight? I guess I got this job because I'm animated. Have a seat, and we'll <laughs> sit down. We'll kind of introduce you. We're going to go by first names. Tonight, to, and we're going to keep things going. We, we uh, Mario and I did a legal one before, and it was super fun because it was interactive. Everybody got free legal advice. <laughs> and when you ask a question, always say, "Hey, I have a friend who has a company that kind of screwed up, and here's what he did." <laughs> so don't, you don't want to say it was me, and I kind of fucked up. That's not what you want to do. All right, so you guys, you're scoring at home from on your right, Imran with Aaron Fox, Gail with um, legal pals, or or. Sorry, I'm sorry. I messed up already. I know. I'm, again, you scoring a note. That's 0 and 1 for me here. Here we go. Uh, Brian with Twilio. Ross, who just spoke. Pam with Aaron Fox as well. I, IP expert, right? And Fred, who's standing in for somebody that's at the White House. Right? So, so one thing we want to find out is you guys, um, I, we're going to have Q&A at the end so that you can ask for that free legal advice, but some topics of interest. So just raise your hand if these are interesting. We'll try and cover them, and we're going to have this as interactive as possible. So convertible notes. Raise your hand if that's interesting. OK. How about general term sheet terms, things like liquidation prices? How about founder shares investing? How about getting rid of a founder? How about horror stories? All right. Looks pretty good. How about World Cup? Did you see the USA today? It was close. We won. So, uh, everybody, so everybody's got mics. So wh why don't why don't we kick it off? We were talking in the green room. I was trying to get them to drink as much alcohol as possible. We did an admirable job. But picking an attorney, right? So, Fred, let me start with. I don't want to put you guys on the spot, so everybody to jump in. But you know, we were talking about the fact that picking an attorney is kind of like a Dating, right? So, how do you go about picking an attorney? How do you validate who they are and what they can do for you? So, Fred, why don't you start us off? Sure. Well, first, I think you should always. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah, there we go. Uh, I think one thing that I see uh, the uh, wise uh, startups do is they talk to more than one law firm. And I think it's easy to get meetings with a lot of different law firms. Check out the uh, attorney that you would work with, see if you have a rapport with them. Find out if they have any expertise um, in the uh, space that you're working in. And then see what see what freebies you can get. Because I think today most law firms will, uh, will give you uh, a lot of time uh, at the beginning to try to help you get started. And so don't be shy about asking uh, for uh, freebies, because I think most every firm has them, big and small. Awesome. Yeah. So I would say um, I have a lot of friends that have actually gone online to some of these lawyer-type referral places, like Avo and, and others, and uh, I would not recommend doing that. Um, I, I don't think that that is a good way, at least right now, maybe it will be there one day to hire an attorney. I think the best thing that you can do is to tap your network, talk to your colleagues, talk to your friends, and get some names of lawyers. And then you should meet with them. You should put them through their, um, you know, uh, hoops basically. Make them show you why uh, they should be your lawyer. There are a lot of lawyers that would like to represent you today. And uh, talk to them, find out what they can deliver, but don't just settle on, on one. Yeah, I guess I, I agree with what Pam said, what Fred said. I guess, again, tap your network and you'll, you know, I think you'll find that you'll end up hearing a lot of the same names. And so the names that you hear from more than one person are probably the people you should follow up with. 
Um, every lawyer is going to tell you that they can do anything that you need done, and they're the best at it. Uh, obviously, uh, take that with a bigger uh, And again, validate that against your network, against other people that you know that have used these people. Uh, your people who are giving you money are going to probably have recommendations as to who you should use. So those are some of the, the obvious ones that, uh, that come to my mind. So Brian, you're our only non-attorney up there. So I mean, you had to pick an attorney. How did you kind of end up here, and did you trial and error? Um, well, I think these are these are good points. We we were a little bit later in the stage. We had some problems we needed these need, that needed solving uh, in Washington. So uh, that's how we got to know uh, Ross and the team and Aaron Fox. And and that we were a little bit later, so it was more about like specialized expertise. In this case, it was around telecommunication and Washington FCC stuff. So we just felt like we needed to go to, to some people who were experts. But on the other point, like um, you know, as the one person up here is not actually uh, an attorney, um, you know, I think. When you're talking to like you know Aaron Fox or Goodwin or Cooley or any of these kind of you know uh, well-known firms, they can all do the job. It's not like you're going to go in there and you know hammer them on you know how to handle a contract or um, or, or or financing or something. But it really, just comes down to rapport and like you know what's your kind of personal feeling with this person because they're they're going to be like an extension of your team if you're starting. Uh, so I I am a lawyer, but I'm no longer a practicing lawyer now. I'm at founder, like everyone else here. Uh, and um, I, I guess that, um, and, and so we did go actually get a lawyer, and I think that um, the one thing to remember is that you actually don't have any way of knowing you have a good lawyer, and, and you won't. So you don't know that. So don't assume that you have a good lawyer. Don't assume that you know that. Don't assume that because you went to Wilson you have a good lawyer. Uh, there's a whole solo boutique market out there that is um, less publicized, that's less um, you, you might hear their names around sort of less because their PR machines are sort of, you know, not as integrated into the network as, as uh, uh, the Wilsons and the Lake of the Bride practice of the world, um, the boxes of the world, um, but they could be perfect for your startup. We actually work with, uh, we started out with Big Firm, uh, and um, just know that the lawyer that you start out with might not be the, the person that you continue with. Uh, and that you really want to manage and be in control that relationship all the way through. I'm gonna I'm gonna switch subjects here. I'm gonna give you a lead off on another one if that's okay. That's perfect. Okay, good. We kind of beat this one. So founders, let's start, let's start at the beginning. Okay, we got a great idea. I'm hooking up with a guy, you know, with maybe my buddy from college, and we're gonna start something. We're founders, right? So we got the idea. We haven't built anything. I think one of the points you talked about, Ross, is you know, luring up earlier than later. So what should we do? Because we're going to get to the part where we have to kind of divorce later. Because this seems to happen a fair amount early on, especially when nothing's figured out. Other than, oh my god, this is going to be great, we're going to make billions. So what do we do? But it's, well, it's, a, it's a really interesting question because I just dealt with that this morning, actually. I'm working with a, um, a startup company, which is, um, there's a solo owner and founder, but he's partnering with somebody who's in the manufacturing business and he's more of the idea guy, and he wants to know whether this other individual should be a co-owner with him. Um, well, before you even broach a subject like that, you got you got to really think about, well, do you want this person, uh, do you want to have a long-term business relationship with this person before you decide that you're going to join him on a on a patent application? Or do you do you want to give him shares in your company? Uh, what what's the what's the relationship going to look like five ten years down the road? Um, and so you know you you've really got to be careful when you're when you're looking at both your, your IP, you're looking at your your stock distribution, um, how you get allocate options, and from the IP side, it's all a patent lawyer. What I what I tell clients as well, look, there's a legal requirement that you actually have to be an inventor um, on the technology before you can be named as a patent. This, is, this isn't just a business decision. And if you get that wrong, then your patent can be invalidated years on down the line. So um, don't just award inventorship as if it's just you know stock options to employees at the company. Um, inventorship should be based on real contributions. And, um, I don't know if I answered your question, but... No, that's a good one. I was just, does anybody have a founder question right now? I mean, it's founder related, that's germane to what we're talking about? Yeah? The young lady just stated that she was an attorney. Bill, Bill Gates. Yeah, yeah. Bill Gates was graduated as an attorney, but yet he didn't hire an attorney for a while. His father was an attorney. My answer relates to the question. Is we, um, so... 
Bill Gates is a trained lawyer and, and didn't hire a lawyer for a long time. Uh, we actually hired a lawyer because we had a founder issue. Uh, that's what brought us to an attorney. We were three. Uh, the, my two co-founders were friends forever from high school. Um, very quickly, we learned um, uh, that the third co-founder was a raging lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> so it was easy. An absolute <laughs> raging lunatic. Uh, how many? I don't know how many people here have children, but you know, you might be perfectly happy married to somebody. And when, when you have children, you really rethink whether or not that's the person you have children with. Having, creating a company is like having a baby. Ask yourself if you actually want to have a baby with this person, or not if you want to date them forever. Uh, and it was an app, I mean, I could, I could take a whole hour telling you what I'm going to do. Oh, please, let's me. go. <laughs> <laughs> Just one, I mean, we talked about horror stories are kind of fun, but I mean, but... The situation you're referring to, this happens a lot. Yeah, and stuff that you don't, so we are a funded startup, Peter Thiel's our lead funder, and in a meeting with Peter, um, the secretary comes in and asks if you wanted anything to drink. Believe me, the answer is no, we're fine. Okay, if that ever happens to you, the answer is no, we're fine, everything is perfect. Uh, and so she brought us all water, and then he said, um, could I have coffee instead? And for the next 15 minutes, he. He just, I don't know if he had Asperger's, or he had like no social skills whatsoever. And we had people come up to us and say, we love, when, when you don't really know, nobody's gonna invest in your idea because your idea could change tomorrow. They're investing in you. So the most important thing is that you be a pleasant, interesting, smart person, and, and this person conveyed the opposite. And people said, we don't wanna invest in you. So this was um, a problem. Uh, <laughs> to say the least. Uh, and uh, we did not have cliffs because they knew each other forever. Uh, and uh, you really want to, to make sure that, you, and, and so we, luckily I was an attorney and I took care of it, but, <laughs> but you really want to make sure um, that you don't, that you, like in any relationship, that you can talk about everything, don't assume anything, you don't know how somebody's going to react in the situations that you can't anticipate. Um, and, and you need to be able to have this relationship. You know, your lawyer isn't going to be able to fix that for you. You need to be able to have a solid relationship. Uh, and if you're going to a lawyer to manage the relationship, there's, a, there's already a problem in the relationship. So, uh, actually, if you pass that down here, I want to ask the attorneys on this end. Um, okay, so... We talked about Cliff, and let's go, I mean, if I'm a founder, does that mean I invest fully from day one? Am I investing over time? I mean, and we'll, we'll get to the divorce part, but that's pretty interesting because I think some people don't understand the mechanics, especially if you get money from a Peter Thiel or an angel uh, or an institutional investment group, you don't own all your stock. So why don't, if you guys want to maybe kind of cover that a little bit, because I think setting the expectation of what the norm is, is good for everybody to understand. Because a lot of people, in my experience, don't know what is somewhat standard with respect to a four-year vesting schedule and cliff and even with founders it's a little different but. yeah uh, one thing on the last point i did a, a, a startup myself Look and closer. one of the things i was going to uh, mention that you should think twice before you just start do a startup with your friends <coughs> because i found that uh, people couldn't speak frankly to each other and we had a lot of money from shareholders and uh, you know you have to do things in the best interest of shareholders. And so, before you do a business with your friends, make sure you can speak frankly to each other, because uh, your friendship may come in the way of doing what should be done, particularly when you try to get rid of the founder. Yeah. <laughs> so, how do you guys handle ownership from day one? How do you how do you split it up? How do you you know how do you set up a schedule? Because you mentioned Cliff, yeah. So, uh, so it's going to be. You're saying that it, as I'll speak as a founder, as a lawyer, uh, you kind of give it. I mean, we were three. Uh, my role was minimal in the beginning when, when this sort of company started up, and so you give it a good guess, I guess. Um, and and in the beginning, there's still a lot of sort of leeway when you're sort of having the discussion. Yes. But again, you need to make sure that it's a discussion that you're able to talk about everything. Um, and a cliff means like 
if the shit hits the fan within that period, you know, that person doesn't walk away with your company. Um, and and this whole, you know, if you if you trust the person, then they sh then then you should all have clips. Right? You really don't know what's going to happen, and then you're in. You have a much better idea of where you stand. Yeah, I guess to answer your question directly, I mean, there isn't a prescription for this. If there isn't like you just do it this way, this is how it's done. It's a negotiation. It's an internal discussion, and so it isn't. There's not a one size fits all in terms of addressing this issue, and so. To, to Fred's point, be able to speak frankly, and then have some realistic expectations. It, it varies by industry, it varies by, I mean, what's, like, is this a long-term play, short-term play? What what market sector are you in? So there's all sorts of variables that, that inform the answer to that question, but all generally speaking is to kind of vet it very, very carefully and very thoroughly early on. Okay. Uh, I was just gonna say there, I think investors wanna see more unvested. So when you think about the proportions, the uh, investors want to see stickiness. And so whatever you come up with, however you allocate it, you want to see more unvested than vested. Yeah, the other thing is set the expect expectation as an entrepreneur. Let's say you've been working on an idea for three years, two years in your garage, and one year with your buddy full time. When you get money, that doesn't mean you're going to get credit for all that. Uh, an investor is going to want you to stick around and not have you only best in maybe the, in 12 months. They're going to reset the clock. It's part of a term sheet negotiation. Everybody's shaking their head. It's like, yeah, that's a surprise one to a lot of people. They're like, really? I didn't know that. So we were talking about convertible notes for a minute, right? Oh, yeah. Um, I had a quick question. Sure. Um, what, have you guys ever served on board? And would you advise having a lawyer on the board to be a part of a board to make it work better? In terms of like a board advising or a shareholder arrangement, when you talk about some good stories or poor stories about um, board formation and putting that together and making it, you know, basically make that once you get investors who are coming in, how do you properly set up a, a management system to run the company? Can, can I, let me put some context on that. So. It's going to depend on the stage of the company. So, I mean, if we kind of short track it, er, er, early stage, are you talking about early stage board of advisors or board of directors? Board of directors, board of directors, so, whatever. So you typically don't need a board until you actually raise money and you have institutional investors. Hey, so, so let's just jump ahead to that. In the back, just repeat the question that we get. Oh, I'm that. sorry. Uh, uh, Wade was asking, um, you know, with respect to kind of board of advisors or board of directors, is there a role for an attorney? Yeah. There typically is, but I'll let you guys kind of cover that. Well, if anybody has not had experience with okay. I just had a thought on uh, yeah. advisory boards. I actually was going to mention something about that a second ago. Um, you know, of course, uh, we're talking about defending yourself and kind of structuring your deal with a bunch of uh, attorneys, of course. Um, but one one thing that uh, the kind of agreements either with co-founders and, and also with your advisors early on do is like, it's really, they're, they're tools to... Um, to align people's interests, right? So it's not necessarily about covering your ass in like the worst possible scenario. It's just about generally, it's more often about generally like aligning people so that they're thinking about the next 12 months and kind of, uh, you know, have a long-term goal that's aligned with yours. And the same goes for advisors. Um, you know, I've been, a, I've been an advisor at a company and also, um, you know, it's a very popular thing obviously here is to kind of align yourself with advisors. But one of the things that happens is over time, um, you know, not not because they're bad people or anything, but they're it's a secondary or, or you know third thing for them uh, on the list of things to do, and um, they probably have a day job too. So it's very difficult to keep them engaged in the way that's meaningful to you as a startup. And so um, this is where the agreement uh, with you know actually having an attorney um, working with you from the beginning can structure those agreements in a way that actually makes it so that you can you know kind of separate from those advisors in a graceful way that's not like confrontational. It's kind of like, it's up to them to be engaged at a certain level in order to realize whatever complicated is in terms of equity or payment or whatever. Good comment. So speed round, I'm gonna get your hands guys here. So advisor terms, two years? Three years? Two to three, generally. Yeah, four? Two, two would be what I would generally recommend. No cliff? When I do advisory for agreements, the way I do them is that I have them expire annually, so they're four-year terms, but they expire annually, so that we don't have to go through the trauma of terminating an advisor. 
So that's why I try to do that. Trauma. I like that. Yeah. Avoid trauma. Yeah. And I, I'm, I'm an advisor to certain companies too, and I do that to myself as well, because I think it's fair. Because if the person isn't performing, you don't want them anymore, but it's hell to try to go through and determine an advisor. That's interesting. So, so two, two to three years is pretty relatively standard. Yeah. Actually, that's a novel approach, Fred. I think um, you know. Can I just mention the founder? So yeah. Lots of people want to advise your company, but I think that we've only taken yes, advice. The microphone thing here. Advice. We've only taken advisors who've actually given us advice, who actually helped us. Um, so, I'm not I'm not rewarding somebody for what they might do. I'm, I'm rewarding them for what they've done. Uh, and that's who's our, on our advisory board. Um, people who um, have gone the extra mile because that's their character, that's who they are. They, they really show that they're invested in the company. Uh, and we then reached out to them and asked them if they wanted to be on our advisory board because it felt fair you know, to, to, to somehow formalize the relationship that they, were, they already had. Okay, right here in the Giants hat, way to go. So I, on this topic, um, so I'm a sole founder and I have two advisors right now and right now we we haven't done anything formal, there's no agreement, but, but I'm also, um, I'm in, I'm, I'm in the process of, uh, of, of, of also doing a round investment. Yep. So, um, so I'm going to formalize sort of terms with my advisors and figure out what uh, points yep. I should give them and how much. Yep. Any, any general advice right. there, half a point, quarter of a point, and... Oh, it, actually, so it's a, it's a great question. Um, I'll just, before I hand it over to you guys, like advisor amounts can vary widely, yeah. like tremendously. I mean, from somebody that helped you wrote your plan to introduce you to first, you know, investors that works with you daily, has industry contacts. You know, it can go anywhere from, you know, a quarter, a third of a point to four or five percent. That's on the high end extreme. I would not recommend that, but, you know, you guys... And we will do. Go ahead, Ross. No, I, I agree with exactly what you said. And again, it's one of these things. It's all. It's all contextual. It's who, who are the two advisors? What have they done for you? It's like you know, you had a really hot waitress and gave you great service, so you gave her a forty percent tip. You gave the okay waitress who kind of was fine. You know, I mean, that's that's kind of like the way that you kind of figure these things out, honestly. Um, but there isn't any kind of prescription as to how, how it's how it's going. But it's it's all very kind of context and, and, you know, touch and feel. But make sure those shares vest. Yeah. Keep the vesting schedule. You don't want to give all of those shares outright, so make sure they vest. You also want to make sure that they're tied to whatever it is you expect. So a lot of times people have expectations that are not verbalized. When we talk about communication, one of the things that's really important is that is that if, if you've given somebody something and you expect something in return, they probably have also a set of expectations. It's very important that those things be clear and then clear again um, so that they know why you're giving them the shares. Perhaps it's even sort of memorialized in writing uh, so that if they don't meet those expectations, you have to read them. Right here. Hi. Um, first off, thank you. This is great. Thank you. Um, so I've uh, founded a company and been working on it for like two and a half years or so. Um, I made a technical mistake, which I'm kind of going back and fixing. In the you mean your friend founded a company? <laughs> 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 that one, that friend? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Me, myself, and I. <laughs> myself and I. Um, so I'm in the process of, of kind of renovating the technology in this, in this uh, same sense. I'm kind of revisiting the legal structure. And I set it up as an, uh, an LLC just to have a structure. Uh, I think somebody recommended having a, a legal entity where you can kind of house everything and shield yourself. I'm now kind of at the point where I think it probably makes sense to probably move to from a, from an LLC to a, to a to probably an S corp or full corp. I guess my question is: is what kind of advice would you give on providing uh, share schedules? I mean, should I establish how how many shares should I establish, and what is reasonable to Expect and going forward on how I divvy those up. I mean, should I just set up like 100 million shares and just piece them out as I take on equity or investments over the next three, five, seven years, assuming it's successful? I forgot to preface the entire presentation with we're not giving legal advice up here, and <laughs> you are not our clients, and you can't sue me for malpractice. Um, so, 
That being said, <laughs> please sign the waiver on the way out. I'm standing the foregoing, right? So again, I, I, I want to kind of give you a, a substantive answer to your question, but at the same time, there are so many things that we need to understand to, to kind of give you an intelligent answer that would be at all helpful to you. Um, but yeah, you should give yourself enough stock to, and it's, it's just you and the company or not, right? Yeah, so I've hired other people, but full on a contract basis. Okay, and so yeah, you've got that all paper up, right? Anyway, so <laughs> in any event, I, there's I did that. we should have an offline conversation about this. Honestly, but there are so many nuances to, to answer that question. But you should give yourself enough stock so that you can you should authorize enough shares so that you can you know bring on people, you can bring on funding, and do all the things you want to do to kind of get where you want to go. Is but that's just to do that at like one fell swoop at the beginning and just put a huge amount and then just divvy it out over time, or just constantly go back as. You can always amend it, I and mean, you, you can always change these things as you go on. And, and, and to, the, to your question as to the, the, the entity type, it would probably be a, be a C Corp that you would establish. Um, but yeah, it's the, that kind of a decision isn't one that's going to be like, I mean, it's something to think about, obviously. And that, we'd have to talk about what your plans are in terms of down the road and where you are two or three years into it. So anyway, there's you can authorize a, a big chunk of stock and if if your needs change in that regard, or if some event occurs where you need more, you can always amend and, and change your, your underlying documentation. Five million shares wouldn't be unreasonable now. No, no, that'd be. I mean, that's the ballpark you'd be talking about. And again, you know, proper counsel can advise you as to, you know, setting up a Delaware C corp, what needs to be done, and then setting up the capital structure with respect to the common stock. I so think there's a uh, there's a range of normalcy here, and you just want to be within that range of normalcy. Right. You know, there's a uh, a range, and, and uh, so that when investors, bankers, or others look at you, they'll say, "Hey, these people know what they're doing." Actually, right. that is a that is a great point, and when we are like that, it's got to be in a normal range because that is the biggest red flag ever. We were talking about a red flag where, like, you know, let's say Fred, you've got a startup. I'm like, dude, I'll introduce you to these guys, and we'll give you money, but you got to pay me. I need like stock and cash, dude. Right? So, what's what's that going to cause, right? Because there's some things that you don't want to do, and that might be one. You guys chat about that one just real quickly, because I, I think we see a fair amount of people that don't use the network properly, and they're always putting up a toll. So, like, oh, oh I know guys with money. This Chinese guy, the bit, the bit, and you like pay. I'm like, what? Huh? Yeah, no, like unlike DC, which is a pay-to-play town. Uh, it doesn't work that way here. So if somebody said that they wanted you know, money or other compensation for an introduction, that would be a major red flag to turn around the other direction as quickly as possible. Um, that's, that, that's, just, I don't, that's just not really done. Um, yeah, that, so, no. I mean, that is, um, that is an absolute red. That is somebody who, who clearly indicates that he or she is not part of the ecosystem in the valley, and and any introduction you give to that person is is exactly the kind of person you can never want to talk to. Um, so this is really a, a part of sort of you give what you have and you take what you need kind of town. So you know our our second round of investors are people who were just there for us for a year, made introductions, talked to us, got to know our business. So when we went for another round of funding, they literally just came to us and said we'd love to invest. Uh, and that's the kind of that, that's the kind of relationship that you foster every time you want in your team. Um, we've seen, you know, we used to be a marketplace for attorneys, and we've seen lawyers who said, "I can help you, but I need two percent equity, and I'm charging four hundred fifty dollars an hour." And uh, um, th in this town, you will find, especially great lawyer, the, the better the lawyer, the more likely they are to spend fifteen minutes, twenty minutes with you, just to like talk about stuff. And there are plenty of meetups like this. Where you can bend somebody's ear for 15 minutes to just get a quick question and slowly build that relationship, um, and that's what it is. It's a relationship. It's somebody who's going to, um, you know, I'm an attorney and I have an attorney, right? Because I want somebody who actually is more familiar with the startup space than I am. Um, and and if a lawyer, you know, speaking about law, if a lawyer says, you know, well, you need to hire a firm and you're going to need, I need a five thousand dollar retainer, no, that's not that's not a guy who's going to be on your team. And, Awesome. All right. Uh, hey, we had a. Oh yeah, in the back. Yeah, with all due respect, uh, I was a VC 20 years ago, and uh, even today I'm seeing where Wilson Sansini and all these other guys 
they want equity where they're not going to really jump through a lot of hoops for you. So I, I, from my experience, you know, that's not the case. The really good lawyers have gotten to that position because they want to charge for that for that level. And I have one other question, which is... Well, hold on. Let me just say, so you're saying that good attorneys want equity? I mean, they charge and, and make... Yeah, because they built themselves up to a certain level. Yeah, they can, but I, I think the options are available where you don't have to give your attorney equity. Well, there's I mean, and there's probably instances where they do, but I would say, I don't know, talking to the panel... There's, yeah. two, there's two kind of worlds. There's the world of... I'm a single person or a, or a couple of co-founders looking to kind of get things started, then it's probably like Yell mentioned, it's like much more of a kind of collaborative thing. When you're talking about getting an attorney before your fundraise and you're going to talk to one of the big firms, like it's expected. I mean, of course, they're, they're going to come in for some sort of, you know, compensation or equity. Like you're, you're not going to go through a Series A without having that in place probably. Equity is still there. I mean, I'm just saying. Like, it, 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 it can happen. It can happen. Can happen. Can happen. Yeah. Yeah. And I agree with you. But you had a second question, real quick? Well, I was just going to ask you, what's the current thinking on which states to incorporate in? Because 20 years ago, um, you incorporated in, in California because California was investor friendly. You didn't incorporate in Nevada because investors wouldn't come to you if you did. Yep. Where is it going today? Because the states are starting to raise their fees. Yeah. And a good question. Don't wanna, so you, don't wanna, you don't want to yeah. incorporate in five states. So, so, so Let's go through this one quickly. Which state to incorporate? I mean, most De Delaware is C Corp, right? So, yeah, Delaware, there's really no reason not to incorporate in Delaware. I mean, I, I, I probably would. I mean, there are certain states that you wouldn't want to be in, but there would be no reason why you would not be Delaware unless you had some other, some tax issue, uh, depending on the residency of the founders. I mean, what's that? Well, you have, I mean, you still have to pay, wherever you're doing business, you have to pay those fees, but the, the state of incorporation, I can't think of a reason why you wouldn't be Delaware. I mean, the Delaware is just totally standard. Hey, do we have any convertible note questions? Any? Yeah. Oh, was why that a convertible not? note question? Why not? You said there's a few states you would not. Well, I, I think the short answer, though, because we want to move on to another one, is on. go to Delaware, right? <laughs> go to what, everybody with that? Go to Delaware. Go to Delaware. Go to Delaware. I still do California corporations, uh, so I don't think you're out of the range of normalcy again if you do that, but as you go through rounds of venture capital, eventually your venture capital is going to want you to reincorporate in Delaware. Okay. I think Delaware wins in the tie. <laughs> I mean, just, well, just, just to point on this, looking at it from a litigation perspective, knowing knowing that oh. if you incorporate in a state, you're going to you're going to be subject to jurisdiction there. And so, if you're in the business of IP or you're being threatened with IP litigation, having your um, corporate state in Delaware will subject you to litigation in a plaintiff friendly venue such as Delaware. Kind of. Did, um, did somebody else have a question? No, we're good. We're good. You guys, what did we not cover that we wanted to, that we talked about that was super fun and exciting? It's crazy exciting. Horror stories. Huh. Right? Who's got a, Pam, you've been kind of quiet. Do you have a good horror story for us? Something IP related, maybe? <laughs> Horrific. I've bloody, no, nobody died. I'm a litigator, so I have really good horror stories. <laughs> um, actually, when we're talking about the founder, uh, that, that issue, I mean, I'm... I'm not one that knows about all the corporate you know, necessities and what you need to do to, to incorporate. But I'm the one that when the thing went down, you know, to hell in a handbasket, the, the clients come to me. And I had this one, speaking of war stories, really ugly situation down in um, uh, San Mateo Superior Court where you had founders that made it very unclear in their agreement um, who had the rights to certain shares, um, how things would happen if someone down the road wasn't performing at a level, you know, that they were all anticipating at the beginning. And uh, this, this, uh, this group of founders has been torn apart by this very horrible litigation where um, <clears throat> one party ended up having a lot more money so they could fund it and the other two did so I would say you really need to be crystal clear, as clear as you can be in that agreement, uh, what the various responsibilities are. And, and don't just think about where you are at that particular time. You need to be thinking about what could happen you know, a year down the road. And then the other thing that I would say generally is that, and this is a point that Imran raised, you really need to be 
thinking about where in these various agreements that you'll sign, and most of the times you may not even look carefully at the agreement, where are you going to be held into court if things go to hell in a handbasket? And, you know, you really don't want to be litigating in, you know, perhaps Delaware. Uh, at least the judges are really good there. Uh, you get pulled into uh, Florida, where I've had clients that have been pulled into. That has been a nightmare for them, and they've been completely hometown. So I would say when you enter into these agreements, make sure that you're very careful with exactly who needs to perform at what level, who gets what, and also look at the venue clauses and look at you know your choice of law clauses because you don't want to spend a lot of time and money litigating those issues. It can be a real nightmare for you. Is, is there any advantage with respect to software licensing agreements that have the jurisdiction California? Can I just quickly speak on, 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 on really? Yeah, quickly. I, I think that um, it's, it's, if you uh, have to, and with all respect to sort of all of us being members of the bar, if you have to take it to your lawyers, that is bad. You don't want to be there. You really want to, it goes back to this point of communication. You really want to choose a person with whom you can talk about anything. And not just the way things are today, but the way things might be tomorrow. Things that might change. If you're going to be part of a company for two years, three years, four years, your lives personally might change significantly in that time. Your roles in the company might change significantly. And if you can't work that out amongst yourselves 90% of the way, um, and you have to go to a lawyer to fix that, that's, a, that's not a place you want to be. So the, the, the best decision you can make is the person with whom, you know, is, is choose a com find a company with somebody who you really can talk to. I just have one comment, partial horror story. If you want to hear the rest of it, you can meet me for a beer after. But um, I've been through a, a pretty high profile bankruptcy, first a chapter 11, and then a chapter 7. And so a lot of the discussion just, you know, it seems, seems and sounds very ominous. Um, and one thing that, that I kind of, and, and a lot of my coworkers, uh, you know, came out of this whole experience with was um, this feeling that, like, the worst that could have possibly happened happened. And everything's okay and everything you know everybody got jobs after and people continued on life went on it wasn't that it wasn't that uh, it was like very traumatic going through it but um, everything worked out so uh, just a positive note there it's, it's easy to make it, it's easy to think that all the repercussions from all these things you're either going to do legally or not do um, are going to be terrible and uh, it's, it's probably not that terrible well, I, I would only take issue with the argument when, <laughs> when, I mean, having it been sued personally, it, being, in, being the subject of litigation, even if you're absolutely correct, is a really horrible experience. Number one, it's expensive. Number two, like, you wake up in the middle of the night if you can get to sleep at all. I mean, it's, it's really a taxing experience. And so, I mean, we're kind of joking about it, but that's why a lot of these, I mean, all these formation agreements, that's why it's right to, like, build your foundation correctly. And so and try to anticipate, you know, again, you can't always anticipate every possible, you know, dreams day scenario, but if you get the fundamentals right, you can avoid a lot of this stuff. And so that's that's what I think the, the kind of the overarching theme that I'd like to deliver. Yeah, and, and just one more thing on that. I mean, none of us like to dwell on the negatives and in the excitement of having this great invention, starting this whole company, we're just gangbusters, you know, moving forward, doing what we can to get to that positive goal. But if you're going to invest in in any money in a lawyer, okay, this is a really good place to really think through, you know, what these various documents, from founding documents to, you know, documents with your customers, contracts, you know, that type of thing, what they're going to say, because the small print really does matter. It really does. And this is not just something that you should, you know, slough off, but it's not part of what your vision is. You need the devil's in the details. And if you're going to invest, get some good advice. Talk through with your lawyer, you know, issues that you may see coming up down the pike. And draw those clauses up in a way that's really favorable to you. I mean, you should all have your own stock contracts, your own form contracts that you use for your vendors, customers, 
other companies that you work with. And those are the contracts you should be proposing. And you want to be working off your contract, which of course is slanted to be the most favorable to you. And not something that's like 25 million pages long, but something that they'll look at and they'll accept and they'll sign. Because you're hoping that they actually are not going to pay attention to the details. And then you'll end up being in a better position. So be careful with that. It really does matter. We got time about one or two questions. So again, remember, free law advice. <laughs> Going. <laughs> yeah, no, it's just hypothetical. <laughs> uh, by the way, we'll, we'll get one, one last thing. So I was deposed once for lit, litigation matter. And I'm looking at Pam here for a minute, and I, they had to teach me because if you ask me what time is it, I'd go yeah, seven thirty. The answer would be yes. I know what time it is. Right? It's so weird. <laughs> Hopefully you guys will never get to that. So we have two questions over here. Yeah. I don't recall. <laughs> it, it, it's like uh, in Wolf of Wall Street. Have you guys seen that lately? It's like, it's a great movie. Yeah? Yeah, I work in the, with food startups and food tech startups. Yeah. And that space, particularly in San Francisco, is very collaborative. And, you know, it seems like everybody's helping. Is there any legal pitfalls? I mean, it seems like, it, you know, I'm always promoting, but at the same time, you might be like opening yourself up for a legal issue. I think I was a still startup. Promote yourself and. But when you're collaborating, I mean, are you collaborating like you? That's a great guy. They have fresh eggs, and this guy's got new tech. So what? What do you? I guess I, I need to understand kind of what's, what's what are you fearful that you might be crossing the line on? Okay. Just yeah. helping that way. Well, trade secrets are good. I mean, if you've got some like you know. The new, you know, rest coke for rest, recipe for coke or whatever. I mean, I, there's like, I don't know what you're talking about in terms of how the collaboration. Dude, this thing cures cancer. If you say something like that, you're probably going to set yourself up for some potential trouble. There was a Kickstarter thing on there that supposedly you could like wave it over food and it's going to tell you what counts. It's like, come on, right? So I think, okay, I, so. Well, I think the advice here is like what my grandmother used to say: is, <laughs> before you say something, it belongs to you, and after you say it, it belongs to the world. So. If there's not something you don't want the world to know, don't say it. Yeah, Brian, did you have something? I like <laughs> no, it's true. All right. Don't say it. Grandmas are smart. Right? <laughs> you know, right? Grandmas are smart. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, so Pam, so you said the, the devil's in detail. So, like, you know, I'm a, I'm a founder of a company, and I have so much I'm already doing with trying to build product and get customers and marketing and sales. and. So I don't really have a lot of time to spend with doing terms of service and, and agreements and things like that. So, but I also don't have a lot of capital because I'm all bootstrapped so far. So, how do you sort of balance this? Right? Like, of course, these things are important. These documents are important. I'm signing, I'm signing a few a week now, and I just I don't have time. I, I just don't have time to deal with this. So it's like, how do you balance that? Like, and I, I want to get away, but yeah, I can't afford the rates yet. So. Then maybe find a lawyer that is is hungry and that is able to work with you, and that will cut you some slack in the short term, and because they're excited about the long term relationship. And it doesn't mean necessarily that that is actually is a lawyer at a solo proprietorship. I mean, that could be a larger law firm. It could be our law firm. Okay, it depends on what your technology is. So. Don't underestimate your potential ability to be able to get a competent lawyer, especially in this market post 2008, that might be willing to sit down with you. And as we were talking about earlier, and I totally agree, if someone's not going to sit down with you and talk to you for 15 or 20 minutes about something generally, you know, they're probably not that great of a lawyer anyway. And, uh, you know, you can get some free advice, but on the other hand, having been the lawyer that actually has spent a lot of time giving out uh, you know, advice and guidance in the hopes of long-term relationships, you know, that is something that uh, I think that if somebody sits down and they are uh, good with you, they give you good advice, you should probably reward them when you, know, you actually can start paying a lot more money. So I would just say think to that too. And, and in addition to things like this, I mean, we do, uh, our firm does a thing where there's a it's a different industry segment, but it's mobile health. We do a, an office hours thing at the Mobile Health Conference in DC every December where companies who are, startups who are attending that conference can apply to meet with us. We do some issue spotting, sit down with them for an hour. And there's programs like that all over the place where you can get 
actually like real legal advice, not just somebody kind of spitballing with you, you know, or for a beer, but actually like looking at your documents, making some recommendations, and then kind of getting you pointed in the right direction. And another thing that a lot of firms do, and, and we entertain these arrangements as well, is again deferred compensation, where we'll give you X thousand dollars of, of time, and you know, at some funding event, or you get funded, then yeah, you know, then pay us. Otherwise, we're just kind of taking the risk and we're maybe going to be writing that off. So there's things like that you can do. So I think I was just going to say one thing. You can, you can talk. Don't worry. We're going to get to you. We're going to get to you. Is no, is that lawyers qualify companies just as much as VCs do in the sense, especially if you're going to defer fees, because if they believe in it, right? If they believe in it, and maybe somebody doesn't know, and they took the extra time, like you said, to listen and understand, which sometimes you don't get in a quick 20-minute pitch, they'll defer potentially a lot because they're backing it. They're putting their name on it with the partnership, and they've had some successes before doing that. So it doesn't always happen, but there can be good things about that. So sorry, yeah. I, I know exactly where you are. I think sometimes lawyers don't understand how little time you have to think about what they obsess over, what, what we as lawyers obsess over. So I don't, when I became the client, I didn't have two minutes to talk to my lawyer because I had, I had to do everything, half of which I'd never even done before. Right, this is really overwhelming. Um, that being said, you don't want to mess this up because you don't you have time to make sure that all your ducks are in a row. Um, and if Aaron Fox is offering you some free legal time, I would take it. <laughs> but really, you want to start to build that relationship. And 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 a thing about deferred fees. Um, be really careful about deferred fees. Deferred fees can end up being a very usurious line of credit, right? You wouldn't borrow $1,000 from a bank and pay them $18,000 six months from now. Right? Amen. Um, and so just because they defer doesn't mean they can't fix that fee. So, so you're the client, and believe me, lawyers are hungry for work. So, so when, when you can, and I completely agree, that when you are the next Facebook and that lawyer has invested in you, um, don't let your VC bully you and force you to go to another lawyer because that person's been with you and has shown it to your company and they deserve to be awarded. Um, but, but when you're you right now, don't be afraid to say, I need you to do this for $1,000 and I need to pay you $1,000. But don't be afraid to invest the time. Because to, to your point, the hours you'll spend being deposed or yeah. suing someone or whatever, pale in comparison to the hour you might have to spend reading that contract or reading that letter or whatever. Awesome. Okay. One last question. Oh. All right. Second last question. Last question. Well, I have two questions. Oh, make it quick. <laughs> it's okay. It's, it's actually you mentioned before something if they could talk about licensing software, um, and I wanted to see where that conversation was going. Is it? I was wondering what if there's a preferred state is California advantageous with respect to. Most software licensing agreements in Silicon Valley are and obviously then, jurisdiction. And then my, my second question has to do with NDAs. Um, uh -huh. I work with a uh, with a software company, um, well, a startup, and uh, we have uh, we're talking to the corporations now. We're signing NDAs, but we're not sure how much can we actually talk about because if you really read them carefully, I mean, English is first of all not my first language, so. Um, I started reading them, and then I, I, I'm kind of lost in the words, and I'm not sure if it's actually protecting what I potentially might say. So how, how much can I say? Are NDAs really different from each other? Or, I mean, like, how, how are you? Are you si are you signing their NDA, or they're signing yours? I'm si signing theirs. They're bigger than you, right? Right. Oh, yeah. 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 And so you want to know what kind of the bounds of the NDA are in terms of what you can say to them. Right. Well, the thing is, like, yeah, I, I brought it, but <laughs> um, no, no, just kidding. Um, so it's actually quite, um, broad. Not quite that broad, and it can okay, be, broad. you know, like you can be the, it, it can work both sides. Like it, it's that big. You, I think rather than kind of getting caught up in that. Kind of games or thinking about like that game, I think you have to think about really about the materiality of whatever disclosure you might be making that you are questioning whether or not it falls within the NDA, right? So, I mean, even though you're signing a very broad NDA that prohibits you from you know even mentioning the company's name in your sleep, you know, I mean, 
what is the materiality of, what are you actually worried about, I guess? Like, and, you know what I mean? Like, what are you thinking you might be doing or saying that might potentially violate the NDA? And then just, it's like any other kind of common sense. Oh, no, 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 no. So I have, I have an algorithm, and I don't want to say, I mean, how much do I say until they can actually steal it from me and hmm. use it? I'm not protected. Oh, oh, shit. Does that make sense? Well, imagine dealing with a situation, situation like that right now, and I guess uh, everyone here can obviously take the microphone, but what I would say about that is that if you're worried about any sort of proprietary disclosure, file a um, patent application or get some sort of intellectual property protection because despite having that NDA in place, that's going to become an issue of fact or dispute later on as to who said what or whose idea it was. And that's why I was asking uh, the, the first question, because we do have a, a patent, but um, it's uh, pending. So. Well, that's, that's fine, but the, what the patent gives you is at least you, you put your stake in the ground, you said this is my idea, and should that patent issue in the future and somebody rips off your idea, meanwhile, you'll be able to assert that patent against them. Hey, uh, on NDA, so say, I'm an advisor to a company called uh, Easy NDA. Go to their website, because what they're trying to do is to establish a standard NDA, a mutual NDA, that has been blessed by a number of lawyers so that people then could use it without going through the expense or the delays of what you're going to say. Yeah, I promise you if that company is big enough, they're not. They had a lawyer work on their NDA. They're 50 grand in. But, but again, it's, their, their purpose is to create a standard NDA so people don't have to go through all this crap with NDAs to get an opportunity. And I think they're doing a good job. Check it out and make your own judgment. Well, Look at that choice of law too. provision in that NDA, though. Again, not to harp on this too much, but you really would like, I think, uh, to at least, uh, well, with the venue provision, if there's any dispute, you don't want to be dragged across country. And so, you know, I would recommend that you have California as uh, the state where any uh, disputes is resolved, and preferably in your county so that you're not flying down to Southern California. And that, that is something that, you know, if you have to kind of dig in your heels, uh, it makes sense to do so. Yeah, I, I think with respect to your question about big companies, like you're breeding outside your species. And that's what all startups do, but big companies have different time frames, ambitions. If you're not funded, many of them try and take advantage of you. I mean, there's no secret about it. It's it's can be, so I think the, IP and the patent filing is smart. The question is, what do you want out of it? Are you want funding from them? You want them to buy you? I mean, so you've got to ask yourself that. But I think, in addition to having good legal advice, there's some strategic business decisions that you need to be wary about. There's some. There's great opportunities that happen working with big companies. <laughs> Sometimes they can be fossil-like slow, but they're amazing. So you know, hopefully you have some good business advisors too, as opposed and good legal advisors. I think it's a combination. I mean, you can set yourself up for some really awkward issues. So if we keep all you guys busy, though, right? Oh, so, okay. Oh, non-compete. Mara had a question. Mark, non-compete, which is Pi Piper. Are not are not competes are not competes legal here in different states? What's the big kind of I just well, California they're generally frowned upon. Yep. So non competes. In most other states there are, uh, some some states have statutory tests as to what's an acceptable length of time that you can be locked up with a non compete. Uh, I just did one actually uh, in Minnesota where they were trying to lock the person up for three years and under Minnesota law you can't do that. So um, non competes are generally in most other places, you know, allowed. Um, but as long as the uh, time is the time and the location, like you know, within 200 miles within North America, would be too big. So I mean, def just make sure that it's reasonable in most other places. Non competes in California are enforceable in the case of acquisition. So if your company gets bought, which is a big deal, you're going to probably get forced. If you're not working for them, you're going to get forced to sign a non compete. And those are enforceable in California. Is that part of the acquisition? I mean, yeah. So those are yeah. part of the golden handcuffs? Yes, exactly. That's the golden, golden state. Awesome. Well, you guys, oh, Ryan, dude, sorry. Please, um, finish strong for us. <laughs> strong. I don't know how much, <laughs> I don't know if this is going to be strong That's enough. How much, uh, how much diligence is too much as an angel investor? And, uh, Never enough. And <laughs> how much can you get away with? 
And how much do you need to actually do? What's that on the angel investor side? Yeah. Like how much how much diligence is too much for the startup, especially since they're out of time and they can't really do much. Um, and how much is not enough? So like, what's the right? What's the fair amount? What are, what are we talking here? In terms of like pages of like oh, pages. of of <laughs> of like, number of lists. Let me do one more answer as an entrepreneur, and then it, I mean. Literally, like, if you're going to invest in my company, you're going to need to know my team, my background. Of my course, I get all that. I mean, I'm talking about like you're looking for the because when you get to the Series A or a, P, a, a P and L and a cap table and a and a, 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 a incorporation documents and what what else? Well, you've put a P and L together, kind of like a zero service and a negative, <laughs> negative, negative. negative. <laughs> right? I mean, but it's easy. You put it together. Try P under a microscope. That's key. Yeah, yeah I, but I think an angel measure is like if you, you have to the file. They've done no diligence. Did, Ryan, that's the other thing. I think use your gut. You're an entrepreneur. Some investors, you guys waste your time. Understand that. They don't get your business. They want to be educated. They're going to be a tool. I'm not saying everybody. There's just a small class of these guys. What kind of tool? <laughs> <laughs> no, a time tool. Okay. In the sense that they, you know, guys that get you and your business, they'll get right away. And I think, I've never seen a deal where people all of a sudden have this ambivalence, then they have this epiphany when they're going through, you know, the ninth ream of documents. They go, oh my God, this thing's amazing. So first of all, you don't know what their other investments are. So they might be investing in a company that does something very similar. And the only reason they took a meeting with you is because they are curious about what else is happening in the space. And you think they're interested in investing, so you expose all your documents to them. They're not, you're, you're a, you're well, they wouldn't do that. You're, you're a startup. Sure. You're like you're like a dreamer. Tomorrow your dream could change. You could pivot. You could God, you know they're investing in you as a person, and you as a person are you know your team or your you know what you know about the space or whatever. So we've done two rounds of investment with some really serious investors. Believe me, they invested in the team and what they thought we could figure out. And you didn't get a checklist. Three pages long. It shouldn't be that long. Delete. No. no. They're not serious. They have a they have a competing product. They're curious about it. Yeah. Well, that's a good question to ask them. I mean, especially if it's a if it's a an institutional VC, you can see there's a great YouTube video. It's a Nikola Tesla pitching VCs. Have you guys seen it? And they're like, who is, who is that guy? He goes, oh, that's Brad. He's our ER. He's he's going to be um, yeah, he's starting a company in your space. And the guy goes, oh, that's not good. So I mean, th these things do happen. But I think I mean that's that sounds a, that sounds that overboard. Sounds Right, that sounds absurd. So, okay, guys, give it up for our panel. Thanks so much. For I think there's some. I would encourage some offline discussion with some of you. You in the purple? You you've got some fun stuff to talk about, right? Awesome. Oh, Mario. Oh, and special thanks to Ross and Aaron Fox. I give those guys a hand for sponsoring us. And also last, last place for All right, guys. Next month, uh, July uh, July 14th is Connected Car. Uh, so that we have BMW, we have uh, uh, and Mercedes, and we have some other great companies coming in for next month. Connected Car. So, so guys, <laughs> Yeah.